Hey guys, I'm Mark. I'm Alon. And welcome to another episode of The Next Man Up. Well, hey listeners, welcome back to The Next Man Up podcast, where we are about raising up the next generation of men of faith and character. Because when boys become healthy and godly men, everyone benefits. My name is Mark Stanifer. Good to be with you as always. And I'm joined once again by my co-host, Josh Wilson. Hey, Josh. Hello, hello. So Josh, today we get to share with our listeners a conversation we had a few weeks ago with a guy by the name of Dale Thompson. He's a, he's a licensed counselor based out of Florida, does a lot of work with men and boys. And we asked Dale to get into some some pretty good topics. And uh, boy, I'm just, I'm really excited to bring this conversation to our listeners. Yeah, I agree. He just did a really great job of explaining how pornography can really interrupt childhood development and brain development in boys and what we can do to interrupt that interruption to keep that hijacking from happening and allow our boys to grow up whole. Yeah, he was able to get into some topics that he works with clients on on a regular basis as as an expert, somebody that has has walked this road helping helping men and boys move uh, move through it and beyond it. So we're excited to bring to you this conversation that we had with Dale. We're going to break it up into two parts today, part one, next week, part two. But I know you're going to enjoy listening to what Dale has to say. So without any further ado, let's get right into our conversation with Dale Thompson. Well, Dale, welcome to the show today. Josh and I are excited that you were able to join us and uh, really excited to bring your experience, your content to our, our listeners. Thanks for joining. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's really great to have you, Dale. We've been trying to work this out for a few months, so I'm, I'm glad it's finally uh, it's finally worked. Although the in person thing back in November in Florida that that boy that seemed awfully enticing, but uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll take this remote connection over uh, over nothing. Agreed, definitely. So uh, we always like to start with a with a guest giving giving our listeners some sense of who you are. So can you just take a couple minutes, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, your family, what you do, that type of thing, and 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 really how how we kind of got to this conversation here today. Sure. Well, um, professionally, uh, you would call me maybe a consultant psychotherapist. I've been involved with uh, treatment with men, boys behaviorally disturbed and ask at risk folks uh, for over 30 years, uh, running companies, providing treatment services, treatment design in substance abuse and um, residential mental health environments, as well as my private practice. I'm identified specifically in faith-based community to support um, those that are seeking Christian counseling and, and uh, weave the experience plus my training and knowledge and life experience together uh, to really tr try to provide healthy interventions for folks that are struggling with particularly uh, battles of the flesh, uh, mostly men and teen boys. Um, going way back, I'm a twin, and um, my parents were the original flower children, ready to change the world. And uh, we had an adopted older brother that was two years old that was Native American and a biological sister that was also two years old. And when we were born... If you did the math right, that means there were four of us within two and a half years of age range. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Really relaxed, flexible, hippie parents to raise, which uh, had so many wonderful benefits, but obviously a, a few problems with some discipline and structure. Uh, fast forwarding uh, to my family, my wife and I have been married 31 years and have been uh, blessed to have three children. Uh, they're all adults now. Uh, the oldest is in Austin and she's a PA and I have my son, he's in New York as a, uh, works with NBC news. And then the baby is just finishing up college this year at central Florida. So we've been really successful in launching them. And I learned a lot through those experiences of raising children as we all do, um, where you mold as a professional, your understanding of what you get taught in books yeah. to connect to life. Yeah. And then there's an also a pretty cool echo from 
raising the kids that I felt that helped actually do a tremendous amount of healing from some of my childhood trauma, which was something that was very unpredictable uh, in unexpected in a wonderful serendipitous way. So I, I like how you said that, Dale, that, that echo. D- describe that a little bit more, what you mean by that. Um, well, uh, uh, being a trauma specialist, one of the things I've been aware of is the reality of a trauma occurring in your childhood that fixates part of your development um, that may alter your course, sometimes negatively, obviously, but many times translating to a gifting. But there's still a piece that may be a hole or a place that's broken uh, that can be correctively healed through um, regenerating a healthy family experience through your mm. own children and your own family. And that's sort of what translated in uh, a really wonderful way at certain points in, uh, with my children. A uh, small example is we moved 13 times in four different states before I graduated from high school. Mm. The family was split up basically three times, once by divorce and two other times by dysfunctional patterns that led to one of us not living at home with the other uh, in kids. Um, and those things were very erratic. Um, before we got on the call, I was sharing with you, Mark, that I've been living in my current house that we're selling uh, for 27 years and been able to provide a stable, consistent pattern for my kids, stable, consistent community. Um, and even though I got tremendous amount of gift things out of my life experience, I just totally can see what God was doing there now on the back end. When I was going through it, it was very difficult. Uh, whereas my children then get the blessing of that consistency and community relationship, all the um, experiences you can imagine in a stable upbringing that way uh, with less uh, obstacles to overcome as they move into adulthood. Mm-hmm. You know, we sometimes limit God on how much he's going to do and what he can do. Um, and if we feel like there's woundings that we can't get through it, and you realize you have these experiences later on that are totally a shock in how that whatever it went it is that you went through translates into an amazing impact on others around you, your own immediate family or culture in general. Um, just, uh, it's really amazing when I see that as I have a front row seat to many people in their testimonies directly as they're broken and we work through healing as well as what's happened in my own life. So Dale, I wonder how much your, your past influenced the, the professional trajectory that you took. Uh, well, it's interesting you ask that because I'm looking back was basically raised to be a therapist. Um, as you know, to be in, in, in the field, uh, you have to understand emotions. And this baseline of that for my organic development was based on really being raised by my parents the way they raised us in the context of uh, open emotional communication, which was very unusual then and not very unusual now um, in really describing and labeling things very accurately to emotional experiences. So they had the language um, at, at an age where uh, it was just very unusual and understanding in the way they raised us, um, people and dynamics, emotional impact. Now you wrinkle in then some trauma experiences. My parents divorced when I was seven, uh, the by coastal moving experience, uh, and then the corrective experience and healing that I got from many of the mentors along the way, um, that leads to uh, this whole um, petri dish of Dale becoming a therapist. The irony is, my twin brother and I both um, went to college together, studied business and advertising, and went into retail first out of school, mm. thinking that's what we would pursue. But quickly, maybe a year and a half in, we both were so unfulfilled that we chose independently to go back to grad school and study psychology. Uh, Also, my father, biological father, was a Methodist minister, uh, liberal socially, if you will, conscious of social consciousness and those type of things. My stepfather's a psychologist, basically been my professional role model most of my life. Um, And we still work together, all three of us, in different ways now, even though we're separately housed in the way we do our profession. uh, so I've always had that built in. Uh, and of course, once I got into grad school, uh, just launched into the content of what was uh, being taught uh, with an advanced awareness early, if you will, and, and how to proceed. I'd been taught Adlerian psychology by the way my family ran family meetings, for example, mm. yep. in middle school, which I had no idea what that was until, you know, it was, you know, just thought that's the way parents do things. Um, and then next thing you know, I'm learning in school. I'm like, hey, that makes sense. I remember that. <laughs> I've got the experiential learning already. Yeah. So you you brought up your father. And when, when we're talking with other other male guests on this show, I always like to go back to 
to father and, and to just ask what what your relationship was like with your dad. You've you've alluded to him in a, in a couple of different ways, but I'm curious what your relationship was like with your biological dad, and and then. Um, maybe even your your stepdad, since he was part of your life for a significant period of time and, and still is. So my dad was a very complicated man. Uh, he had some very specific trauma uh, before he met my mother, uh, maybe a year or two before, while he was in college, where his mother hung herself mm. in a way that he would discover her and feel blamed and guilty for what happened uh, in a very horrible way. Way. He's ostracized at that point from his family. He was already pursuing the ministry and theology when he was in school. Uh, eventually met my mom um, and then came into the marriage, came into the family with this desire to correct things. In many ways, he did a great job. In many ways, it turned out to make it a lot about himself. Uh, uh, many, uh, what they did as parents as a unit were very loving and caring and um, raised me in a way that I've, I've always felt safe, was always provided for. We were usually in a parsonage uh, and surrounded by the church com- community as a whole that also sort of guided some safety and some connection um, and development. But uh, pretty quickly uh, early on, I was very aware of emotional dysregulation through my father. He was very angry at times. Um, this is one of those things where the echo later on in life, I really had some wisdom about as I had my own children and understood stress when they're younger, et cetera, yeah, yeah. how that translates. Um, but early on before too long at seven, six and a half, my stepfather came on the scene, um, a much more passive, less, uh, demonstrative type personality, um, and was, uh, role modeling a little differently how and, and what to do as a man, um, skills driven and task driven and um, competency driven, where my father was much more intellectual, cerebral and uh, tied up in worldly uh, understanding. So you're you're getting your example from your biological dad, from your your stepdad. You're you're putting together this this picture of what it means to be a man. Was there a point in your life? that you can look back on and, and feel like I, I, I crossed over the threshold. I'm not a boy anymore. And I may not, I may not have it all figured out, but, but I'm a man now. Was, was there a point like that in your own life? Well, it's interesting. I'm sure like most of us, we get into our twenties and we think we figured it out. Um, and <laughs> we, then we get to our thirties and we're like, Hey, I need to keep working on this. I was right. stupid in my twenties. <laughs> right. Um, there's been incremental, I'll, I'll, I'll say it more this way. There's been times when I've felt more healthy as a man at incremental steps in my life, grounded by marriage, grounded by kids, um, certainly by the, the chronological age progression as we get to a certain point, as also affirmed by certain competencies through academic achievement and those type of things. Um, I look at more as this journey than really there's a, finishing point. Um, I, I do recall this reality check. The, uh, I had I received my um, professional job before I graduated from college in my undergrad work. And I remembered this sense of, oh, this is on my shoulders now. Mm. I'm no longer in anybody else's nest, if you will. And I got to figure this out. And I guess if you had to figure out a point of delimit delineation there it would have been at about 21 as i was experiencing that process um, yeah that that coming of age if you will where it's it's on you you know the, <laughs> there's, there's no school uh, cafeteria anymore there's exactly. no school dorm like oh i have responsibilities <laughs> that I, I i have i have to earn um i have to earn my paycheck did do you find that your father figures had prepared you for that moment or for that transition? Or did you find yourself kind of stumbling and finding, groping your way forward into manhood? Oh, clearly I was kind of crawling. Uh, <laughs> you know, later on, what they shared with me really applied as I individually matured. But at the same time, some of the difficulties from my childhood trauma haunted me. An anxiety type uh, lingering that was constantly there. This this fear of being alone. This fear I had this uh, irrational fear of never really having a family myself for some reason because of whatever echo of negativity that the enemy placed in my head would attack me on. 
Um, and I gravitated quickly to figuring out what the next step was, which fortunately between going to grad school, marrying my wife about the same time really allowed for some anchoring in that. And then, um, you know, all these things we do as men that give us some sense of confirmation that we're a man, start to have children, function in a certain way, buy your house, et cetera, uh, helped on the outside, at least helped me feel competent and, and uh, allowed for a sense of understanding of who I was at that point as a man. Dale, you've mentioned trauma on a number of occasions, and, and I, I have to admit that uh, I, I think my definition or my understanding of trauma is probably a bit too narrow. As a professional in this field, as someone who's experienced what, what you did experience and, and are labeling as trauma, can, can you help us understand how, how you help others understand uh, how, how to think about trauma or to define what trauma is? Sure. Well, there's a couple pieces. First, it's the person and how they're receiving it. A lot of people can go through some very dysfunctional things but not receive it as traumatic. What's difficult is what the age is of the child and, or the individual and um, the developmental ability to process the information. Um, if you have a highly charged emotional experience as a child, whatever that could be in a negative way, the, the brain stores it in a bunch of different locations in a fragmented way. Uh, much like in a, when you would dream as an adult and you have all these crazy pieces being mashed together that don't make any sense, when those reminders are, are triggered, um, it, it's a, an emotionally overwhelming experience and we drop back into, as adults, sometimes the emotional state we were in as a child. Mm. Um, what's important to understand when I'm working with somebody with trauma is that they need to know that they're not alone. And this is a very common experience, but there's more extreme levels that generate a hyper alert status and post-traumatic stress type patterns that are often very quiet during certain ages, say during the 20s, because we're so busy, family starting and whatever. Uh, it's not uncommon that I'll see men in their 30s or close to their 40s or 50s that have finally started to realize the impact of that experience on them. Uh, and we work on bringing it back to the present and understanding how that's impacting what they're doing and making some choices about working on healing uh, related to it. You know, the reality is that if, we, if we're sitting on something as guys, we compartmentalize so well for a certain amount of time. Uh, and, but at a point, we start to cope with it in a dysfunctional way. Mm. And, and segueing into our addiction discussion, basically, many of us then turn to self-soothing behaviors that become very comfortable um, that allow us to, to avoid seeing whatever that ugly is deep down underneath us, uh, the real vulnerable soft space that is very scary for us guys to face and to look at. So that's a great segue. Let, let's keep going there. So um, the, the, the broader open-ended question that I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to wrestle with is, as you look across the landscape of, of men, um, or, or in some cases, just simply adult males, Mm -hmm. Um, what are, what are the, the big challenges that, that, that we are working with that you see in your clients or, or you see as you, as you look across that man landscape? Well, that's a broad question, but I got a couple of quick things that come to mind. One is how high octane we try to live our lives and act like they're normal at that level. So uh, most achievers, alpha men, uh, A personalities have this expectation of what they should be functioning at. That's financial success, marital success, uh, materialistic achievement, et cetera. Um, so we're spinning plates, uh, many more plates than maybe prior generations would have been spinning with this demand, this internal demand of function in that space, which is not sustainable without balance. The other thing is, Many of us have been raised in an uh, American culture that says not only do we need to have that stuff, but I don't know what to do without it. Mm. So I'm very vulnerable in that space. Then we add the, the, what, the trappings of what that is about, uh, which is usually indulgence. Uh, what, what could that be? That could be alcohol. That could be drugs. It could be sex. It could be uh, food. It could be all these even healthy indulgences that can get too far. Exercise, workaholism, and so forth to feel like we are someone and define us who we are through our output versus really dialing into who we are 
and our purposefulness in Christ and really being comfortable in that space, even if that means we don't have all those external trappings. Um, the brain's really fascinating with what it does when we start to uh, move into adult life and experience certain experiences and build a tolerance for certain things um, and how it sort of calls away the other growth opportunity space um, and, and, and builds the further tolerance in the indulgence window. Um, and we just continue to achieve more based on this desire to thrive and, and be uh, successful, as well as find that self-soothing um, comfort that feels so good when we indulge it. So one of those indulgences, as you know, because you work with guys in this space is, is around sex or um, maybe said differently, if you narrow the question down to what are the challenges that guys are facing today when it comes to sex and sexuality, what are you seeing? Again, with, with either patients or as, as you look across the, the culture that we live in. Um, well, obviously our culture is saturated with it. It's such a place that it's so normalized from a, we have to start with the baseline of understanding that sex is the root base of our instinctual behavior. If there ever was one for a man, God made us to procreate. God made it enjoyable for a very intentional reason that we would continue as a species. If we don't have that in, engaged in healthy balance, it is the easiest addiction to hijack the rest of the brain because the behavioral response in the brain on an orgasmic response triggers more endorphins or equal to as many endorphins as almost any drug you're going to use in the context of that window of ejaculation and orgasm. Um, when you do that and you connect that with saturation behavior to self-soothe, say you're uh, responding in a way to escape emotional pain or to just try to escape stress, all those things, uh, it creates a, a short circuit in what happens with the brain and to get there from point A to point B neurologically uh, is quite sophisticated. At the same time, the cranial matter in the brain is acting like it's in control and really believes it's in control, even though it's clearly not at a certain point as we start to expose ourselves to risk um, and, and further uh, fragment and, and create dysfunction in relationship and sabotage marriages and um, uh, really wreak havoc over uh, structure of what we should be as men in Christ. So, so pause there for a second. So help me um, connect the dots for me again, where, where you said that the cranial matter thinks it's in control, but it's clearly not. Can you, can you expand on that? Well, if you think about the brain structure, you know, your fist on top of your hand sticking up, your wrist is basically, um, your central nervous system director where, where your passive uh, neuro neurological function exists. You don't have to think in, to breathe. You don't have to think to make your heart beat. You don't have to think to have your eyes uh, dilate and focus. Uh, right, the next thing next to that is procreation and sexual functioning neurologically. Mm. Uh, because it's there, this is instinctual root, um, and because many of us that struggle with the addictions, uh, whatever it may be, have super high cerebral functioning, and i.e. they're intelligent, we find very convenient um, strategies to defend and justify the behavior or compartmentalize and keep it a secret to avoid facing the truth of the reality. For example, let's say that um, somebody has uh, frequented massage parlors as a coping mechanism to, de to deal with stress. And they go to one of those places and they hide and they know what part of town to go to to indulge that behavior and they come home and nobody knows. They're telling themselves, well, nobody's going to know. But if you put that on blast and you said, well, no, that, that's going to be projected onto the video screen in my house when I get home and my wife and my family's going to see it. it's going to be telecast to my parents and at my job and at my church. There's a whole different reality that you face. Um, so that would be when you're really admitting I've got a problem versus the, the first example where you're avoiding and you're able to encapsulate it. Um, and, uh, you know, needless to say, when you're in that space of denial, you're not facing the reality of I could get an STD, I could get arrested, all these things that would just destroy you and your public image um, that would really get your attention much quicker if you were having to be honest about that. 
Um, what, what is also really important to understand in any addiction, but particularly in sex addiction, addiction, the chase is just as satisfying almost is the culmination of it. Mm. And often, depending on the tolerance level, the culmination of it is very anticlimactic. But the anticipation is what drives so much of the excitement. And that window is the best window to block it if you're able to help folks see it and uh, become more honest and in control with it. What are you seeing either in your own, in your own clients or uh, as, you, as you just observed, what are you seeing in terms of the, the sex or sexuality challenges that boys are facing today? Oh boy, man, uh, there's a whole lot of stuff to talk about there. I absolutely work with a ton of boys. Um, we have Z generation dynamics, which is uh, the piece of the culture where boys are raised in a very broad uh, way of perceiving what life is as a person. Um, dads are often very emasculated or not present, and I would say 60% of the households, if not 70, um, and they're really seeking and trying to figure out what it is to be a man or to be who they're supposed to be. Um, crash that up against adolescence and puberty uh, in experiences where that's all acceleration in the brain and no breaks, and they have unfettered access to pornography on any device that they can get their hand on that has Wi-Fi. And yeah, we have a cocktail for, for quite a bit of a problem here. Um, the reality is many of our boys are very conscious of the values that they want to live through and live out through their beliefs in church, et cetera, as well as the way they've been raised um, and really struggle with the shame and the embarrassment of what's happening in the growth of who they are as a person. Um, um, and you add to the fact that nobody in their household culture around them is communicating about their body and health for their body in a broader sense uh, compared to girls who, because of starting their periods, et cetera, that discussion happens so much younger. Um, and they have a different perspective of, yes, I'm going to start seeing the doctor uh, once a year for this and that because, you know, I start my, my period. Uh, boys don't do that. So I don't have this other grounding of what's healthy, what's not healthy. And of course, you add peer culture, man code type um, brainwashing. And next thing you know, it's about braggadocia and, and how many girls you can have sex with and what it is and showing your friends stuff to get um, peer approval. Um, and then it's just, a you know, the dam is broken at that point. Uh, the scary thing is neurologically in this place, uh, we're collapsing the architecture of the brain and the other space that can be um, built in the structure of growth for the future uh, because then it hijacks that so much more depending on the age they're exposed to the pornography or sexual behaviors or just sexual innuendo um, and anticipation. So I think I just heard you say that the experiences as a, as a boy in this, in, in this space can influence brain development. Did I hear that right? Oh, you definitely did. So let me give you an example. Let's say when the brain's growing, um, it's like building a skyscraper. And there's these rooms in um, each floor, and there's a height of the skyscraper, and there's a width of the skyscraper. What happens when your brain is growing, for boys particularly, it doesn't stop growing until about 25, is there's a lot of um, rooms that are unfilled, and the height of the skyscraper is taller and it's wider, depending on uh, certain things that can happen. Now, they don't get filled in until much later on. We'll call those maturity windows that fill in. Uh, but something like sex exposure or early drug exposure, what it does is it limits the height of the skyscraper and limits the number of rooms that are there for long-term growth, maturity, wisdom, development, um, because it's just so hard to, it hijacks the brain so much. Um, and if that makes sense, one of the things that happens then is that, the, let's say um, at 16, when you maybe would have a healthy sexual discussion and understand sex in a healthy way, um, you're, you're at the 16th floor. But let's say you got exposed to sex at 10, and you're only at the 10th floor, and you're, you're, your height above you has started to be developed, but not fully constructed. So then I'm stuck emotionally as a 10-year-old with an emotional bond to sexual interaction or sexual information, um, which is stimulated usually visually, um, which is one of the frontline um, informational resources for us men. 
Yeah. Um, and it really would then limit potentially development for other things, not just um, intellectual or cerebral development, but emotional intelligence, which is the high, one of the highest predictors for success in life is your capacity to manage stress, distress, and overcome it. There's something that I want to go back to, though. You use the word shame, even without a, a negative or traumatic uh, sexual experience as a boy depending on the environment that they're raised, they can begin to develop a sense of shame about just natural development in their own body. Absolutely. Very so can you, powerful. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, depending on their family system um, and how their body is perceived, how they perceive their body compared to their friends um, and how they're uh, having whatever sexual experience, um, that could be a, a really dark secret. You know, I think in many men and boys, uh, the solution is always getting to that softer space, but the a presenting problem is usually an aggressive emotion or other aggressive behaviors. Um, the shame, embarrassment, uh, confusion, those are three key ones that are often driving a lot of aberrant behavior that I'll see in, in boys and men. Um, but once we get to that shame piece and we label it, they really realize, hey, this is indeed something that I've struggled with and something they care about. Um, but our world doesn't support that. If you think about kids going into adolescence and puberty and middle school, um, everybody's worried about how we measure up and who's mm. the strongest and who's the fastest and who's yep. and code uh, cesspool 101 um, and, and how, how that I'm viewed by the rest of the world. And if you're an outlier, say so you're an art uh, artist or a creative spirit, uh, a non-athletic intellectual um, there's a lot of folks that end up really feeling marginalized in that space. And then you add this uh, exposure to porn or whatever. And, you know, of course, it feels good if you're uh, masturbating and ejaculating. But at a certain point, there's this awareness, maybe something's wrong with me or is this really functional? And depending on how the family handles it, um, it could really drive it to a much deeper level of shame and embarrassment, um, which then creates all kind of havoc in their understanding of what creates true intimacy later on. Uh, which is one of the biggest pieces of the sabotaging nature. That's one of those rooms that's really messed up when when we're exposed early to sexual activities uh, because that's the real solution and the real salve of what healthy love is about, that true emotional intimacy, not the sexual intimacy. Well, guys, I hope you're enjoying the conversation we're having with Dale. I know Josh and I are and did very much. And as we said at the beginning, um, pleased that we can bring this conversation to you. As I said, also, we're going to break this up into two parts. So this is, uh, this is where we're going to pause for part one. But don't worry, we'll be right back next week to finish the conversation as we get deeper into pornography and, and how that impacts boys' brains and what we as dads can, can do to help our boys to grow through this and, and beyond it and become the men that we want them to be. So join us next week as we pick up where we left off. And until then, we'll say, as always, adios. Hey, listeners, thanks for journeying with us on this Next Man Up podcast. You know, we would love to hear from you. Maybe you have a question or an idea, perhaps a topic for us to consider. If that's you and you want to reach out to us, you can get us at feedback at the nextmanup.com. That's feedback at the nextmanup.com. Again, we'd love to hear from you. Until next time, we'll see you later.